the Alan Pinkerton of the Pinkerton Detective Agency because they're actually working at the time for President Lincoln. So he hires him. Why don't you watch her house? First Battle Bull Run happens in July. In August, Pinkerton's hired to look at Rose Greenhouse house. And he's literally just like peeking in the window. <laughs> he's peeking, like he's standing on someone's shoulders looking in the window. Welcome to Talk With History. I'm your host, Scott, here with my wife and historian, Jen. Hello. On this podcast, we give you insights into our history-inspired travels, YouTube channel journey, and examine history through deeper conversations with the curious, the explorers, and the history lovers out there. Now, this week, I want to tell folks about the our hashtag historic newsletter. We've actually seen some solid growth recently. And we're excited this is starting to gain some traction because there's a lot of history we can share through the newsletter that might not ever make it to the podcast or a video. So if you're curious to check out that newsletter, it's free, doesn't cost a single thing. All you gotta do is go to historynewsletter.com and you can sign up for free. So that's historynewsletter.com, historynewsletter.com. Check it out. It's a lot of fun. You can feel free to, to email us back when you get the kind of welcome aboard initial email. And actually with that, I want to call out someone who's been listening both to the podcast and subscribing to the newsletter. It's a monthly newsletter. And she actually responded to one of our newsletter posts recently. Her name is, so she said, hello, I've been listening to your podcast for a bit now. Currently I'm sitting drinking coffee and reading you never forget your first. It's a book about GW. Anyway, it got me thinking. The book references that many of Washington's letters were never found or saved. My question is, when did preserving presidential pa papers become an official act? So I know, Jen, you actually already knew something a little bit about this. So I knew I had worked at the James Garfield house. I had done an internship there and basically inventoried all of their not artifacts, but all of their artifact holding material, everything that it encloses the artifacts, I inventoried all of that for the National Park Service. The James Garfield House in Mentor, Ohio is considered the first presidential library because his wife, Lucretia, after he's assassinated, thought people might want to read his paper someday. People might want to read what he wrote. People might want to read his letters, his journal. So I'm going to save everything. Now that wasn't official. She did it because she just had some forethought. So Tina, George Washington's papers were destroyed <laughs> so, and not purposely. So what happened with George Washington is before, and I'll get to the date, it's really in the 1970s, before the 1970s, presidential papers and vice presidential papers belong to the person yeah. belong to that person, the president or vice president, and they could take them home and they can disseminate them how they decided. And with George Washington, he had planned to build like a library, like a vault with his papers, but unfortunately he died before he could do that. And he gives his, his a get my papers in order, get my accounts in order. Those are like his dying words on his deathbed, but never save my papers. Now his papers were given to some people at the time who wanted to write a Washington biography and they kept them and used them for a biography, but then they just stored them and there is one letter that said, I had Washington's papers, but they've become so damp and overcome by rats. Wow. So you can imagine some George Washington's papers were just destroyed from someone just being careless and storing his papers and not realizing that they would be of importance. Now you do get Martha Washington destroyed a lot of letters. Uh, Arthur Lincoln's son, Robert Todd Lincoln destroys his father's letters. Arthur's son will destroy his letters. Harding's wife destroys his letters. She says because she doesn't want anything embarrassing remembered about him. I will say a lot of people destroyed letters at this time. And I talk about this a lot with Jane Austen and her sister destroying her letters is because correspondence is very personal. So is, is, was it like like pillow talk type stuff? It's not really pillow talk. It's more like health talk. Oh. Because okay. yeah. it's the time where people are getting sick pretty consistently. So 
How often are you going to the bathroom? Yeah, things What's like that. it okay. like? What's its consistency? Those are, and it's very personal. And people like, like phlegm kind of type, because sure. sickness is a way of life then. Yeah. And overcoming sickness is a way of life. And people don't want those kind of personal affairs yeah. to be brought into the public. So when did like people really start saving more intentionally or did it start with Garfield and became like official policy and law later? It really starts with Garfield. In 1939, our FDR donates his papers and books for an official library. Uh -huh. And that's when the official library system, presidential system really starts. But Presidents can still destroy their papers. Yeah. So if you don't like something you wrote or someone wrote or a correspondence that was a little, it. you could just burn it. But it's not really, and this is really interesting, it's not until the Presidential Records Act of 1978 that those official records of every president and vice president are the property of the United States of America. You can no longer destroy them. And this was brought on because Nixon sought right. to destroy his records relating to his indiscretion sure, and and everything he had about resigning in 1974. Right. He tried to destroy all of that, the official records of it. And to stop the National Archives, to stop him, pass this act, it really fell under the Reagan administration. All of his papers were now official records of the United States government. They did go back and retroactively get Nixon's papers, but... This is when it now becomes an issue. And even today, we're getting into like President Trump's papers and Vice President Pence's papers and President Biden's papers. People are taking these things home. People are putting them in storage. And really, they don't belong to them personally. Yeah. That goes for everybody who's a president or a vice president. They all get to go to the National Archives and the archive can decide okay. what is important or not important. Yeah, no, I just really appreciated... Tina kind of su question. submitting the question. That was a great question. So thank you so much, Tina. For anybody else that subscribes to the hashtag historic newsletter at the at historynewsletter.com, we have another monthly one coming up here in the next couple of weeks. I've got some articles I'm putting together. So there should be interesting stuff. So if you're ever curious, we've got podcast recommendations, video recommendations. Mm -hmm. But Tina, that was a great question. Great question. Thank you so much. Now, on to kind of our main topic. We are, obviously, we're talking about the video. Yes. So video that posted yesterday was about Rose Green Howe. She's a Confederate spy during the Civil War. Civil War. So, so tell us a little bit about the background of Rose Green Howe. Okay, so we have Rose O'Neill Green Howe. And O'Neill is important because this is her background and to learn more about her. She is born, they, I'm not sure, 1813, 1814, in a small rural farm in Maryland. It's a tobacco farm and her family is a, they produce tobacco, they have enslaved people who work the tobacco farm. So of course they're a proponent of enslavement. And then when she's about 13, 14 years old, her father is murdered. And when he's murdered, he leaves behind a lot of debt and the children have to be disseminated to members of the family because his her mother, the widow, can't take care of all these children. And Rose O'Neill goes to an aunt in Washington, D.C. At 13, 14 years old, her aunt runs a boarding house in Washington, D.C., which is a very common thing. Mary Surratt is running a boarding house in Washington, D.C. So they have these boarding houses at the time, it's, a, it's what women did if they were widowed or single. It was a very acceptable job for women at that age and level. And because a lot of people are in and out of D.C. having government meetings or official meetings, a boarding house is a great business because people aren't really buying property there. And I thought it was interesting because we were trying to we were trying to find out when we were putting the video together mm -hmm exactly where this boarding house mm -hmm. might have been or later on the like some places got turned into prisons or in the civil war mm -hmm. and the other so we we're trying to search out where these things were but we found out there was like 80 different boarding houses in the washington dc area and you know, if you know back then like dc is still small even for that that time sure period. so when you think about it people who were representing government or in the government 
didn't do what they do today. They right. don't have two houses. Right. They don't have a house where you live and a house in DC. They had a house where they lived and they came to DC to do their job, to do their meetings, and they stayed at a boarding house. So the boarding houses were very common and they were, or hotels, the Willard Hotel is a big hotel in DC that is known for famous people staying there. And so that's what people did. They didn't really own homes in DC. And so her, so Rose O'Neill goes to live in this boarding house and it's a congressional boarding house. So it's a, it's clientele is government higher, higher end people. Yeah. And, and I think too, right. So if Rose was the daughter of her father before he got, was a property owner. So she was probably decently educated, decently educated, lower class, but not the lowest class. Yes. So this is how she gets first introduced to this new level of society. Right. And so it's in her aunt's boarding house that she's starting to meet congressional people. And this is how she meets Dr. Greenhow. And Dr. Greenhow is a, he's a federal librarian. He has a medical degree, he has a law degree, and they hit it off and they start dating. And she was actually, we didn't, this didn't make it into the video, but she was actually introduced to him, met him, the social circles through, what's her face? Dolly Madison. Dolly Madison. Yes. So she's yes. moving in those circles. Right. She's moving in the Madison circle, former president, Madison circle. Dolly is, of course, older at the time. So she meets Dr. Greenhow. Right. And when you think about it, Greenhow's marrying kind of below his status, but he must... But her... If I remember right, now Historical USA was with us on this video, mm -hmm. but I, if it was either you or her that said that Rose's sister actually married like a congressman or, or someone related to you know, some well-known politician yes, type. Yes, yes. And so she was, the doctor was marrying below, but he was also marrying the sister of someone who just got married to someone a little bit more famous. Yes. So there's that balance there. That's balance is moving up. You could say that yeah. they're they're, and then that's how families did it back then. Sure, they're like, hey, I'm gonna educate my daughter mm -hmm. as best as I can. I'm gonna send her somewhere, and if she gets in high society circles and start mar starts marrying up, that's how families raise their status. Absolutely, and there were people who definitely sought that out. Yeah, and that so. She marries Dr. Greenhow. They have, I think it's five, they have four children. He goes out west. She goes out west with him. Before she has her fourth child, she comes back to D.C. to have her fourth child. He stays behind and he actually dies. Yeah. He falls off like an elevated sidewalk and is killed. This was in D.C. or out no, west? No, out west. Okay. California west? Uh, California west. Oh, wow. And so she becomes a widow with a pension and moving in these high echelon political circles. And this is about the onset of the Civil War. We got Buchanan, we got Davis. She believes in her Southern allegiances. Yep. When the Civil War does break out, she is already embedded and she doesn't leave DC because she's only her, when she moves back to have her child, and her husband stays out west, she buys that boarding house four blocks to the north of D.C. Okay, so she didn't take over the one from her aunt. She no, gets a new one. she gets her own. Okay. And that home is now where the Hayes Adams Hotel is. But if you see our video, it's such a prominent spot in Washington, D.C. It's like you could literally maybe... Uh... Patrick Mahomes could throw a football from that hotel <laughs> to the White House. I know. And if you can imagine 1860 without Lafayette Square, without the White House lawn, without yeah. the gate, you could walk from there in 10 minutes. It's not even 10 minutes. Five minutes. It's yeah. literally a stone's throw. So that's one of I the mean, fun you could things. See, you could say, you could say, I want to see you walk to the White House and wave to me when you get to the porch so I know you made it. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah that's literally as a parent, you could do that. You're like, hey, go take this to the president. I made him some cookies. Yeah. So that's how close she is to the White House. So again, people who are meeting Lincoln and having discussions and you got Seward's house is right beside Lafayette Square. So like you a have block away. like a block away. Yeah, he's Secretary of State. So you have all of these people in close proximity. So when war breaks out and she's already running in these circles, she's able to start to gather information and gather and secrets. And Lisa had mentioned that she was actually kind of a big fan of Jefferson Davis. Oh, yeah. She loved Jefferson Davis. And Lisa had said that in, in her research that it was she started some of this kind of spy or getting information, right? They probably didn't call it spying right mm -hmm. up front for me. It's like, hey, 
How many troops do they have? Do they talk about that in your boarding house? And yeah. At the behest of Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis had asked her to do it. And yeah. she felt very loyal to him. She loved him. Yeah. And she really had, like, when she, and I'll talk about when she goes to the prison, he, he is iconic to her. Yeah. And she believes in him. And she believes in, like I said, the Southern allegiance and what they're fighting for and what they believe in and states' rights. She, she's very bought in to that. So having the boarding house and having these single men or unsingle men, but men of higher status come visit her, she's able to get information. And one of those men is, of course, General Irving McDowell. He's in charge of the Union Army in the beginning of the Civil War. Yep. And he comes and visits her. And she asks very <sighs> undermined questions. Like, I see you're getting troops ready. How many troops should I pray for? Should I pray for 3,000 troops? And of course he wants to boast. Yeah. So he's no more like 30,000 troops. And she's, oh, and then she's able to get that information back to Beauregard, who is going to be in charge of the Confederate army on the other side. It's going to be 30,000 troops. They're thinking of a place south of Manassas. And in the July time frame, yeah. they're going to march the troops. They think it's going to be a quick and easy, decisive battle. The railroad line is there, and that's why they're going to go there. And so he's able to get enough Confederates there to meet that level of Union troops, 30,000, to put up a good defense, to put up a good fight, to actually push them back. And it's enough to scare them that it's not going to be easy. That's why she's so regarded. She gets a lot of credit. Beauregard gives her credit. She gets a lot of credit. This is probably her biggest claim to fame, yeah. First Battle Bull Run. But she gets a lot of credit for this because of all the information she was able to get to Beauregard and he was able to use it. And then the Confederates were able to put up a good defense. And this really is the moment when Lincoln realizes that could be a quick war. He also realizes that McDowell is an incompetent leader. So you're going to get a lot of this. And you're going to get a lot of stuff that comes out of this battle. Next week will be Bull Run. We'll talk about the things that come out of this. But you're going to get the Union very much falling back on reputation. Yeah. They're going to lose a lot of reputation and you're going to get the South really exploding their reputation. And you're going to get some famous names and monikers that are going to come out of the first battle of Bull Run. So you're going to see the morale kind of yep. switch it's a little. It's kind of like a big rally for, for the South. Big rally for the South. And it's a big hardship for the Union. One of the reasons that we did this video this month right, was obviously Women's History Month, but also it ties into our video from last week, which was about a union war spy, but also another female. Yes. And so we talk a little bit about in this video how no one really suspected Rose Greenhow because she was a woman. Because she's a woman. And yeah, and that, so the same way that the union female spy is operating under this pretense that women are not at the level to be privy to this information. They don't understand this information. It's just too much for them to comprehend war. And they so they can slide under the radar. Same thing, Rose Greenhouse using the same thing to her advantage. I'm a Southern belle. Yeah. All I care about is entertaining. I'm not interested in your war talk, but I'll listen to it because that's what you seem to want to talk about. When really, that's all she really wants to talk about. But yep. she'll pretend like it's not. Um, and I wanted to do women focused because of Women's History Month. And I wanted to do a union spy who was pivotal in the Battle of the Ironclads and then a Confederate spy who's pivotal in the first Battle of Bull Run. And they both happen to be women. So we go to Bull Run and do that kind of through the lens of, mm -hmm. the, women. of the women that mm -hmm. serve there, I think different. But again, one of the things I just, uh, it just was so interesting to me that last week's video and this week's video, it doesn't matter what side of the union, what side of the war you were on, whether you were black or white, because you were a woman, people just didn't assume that you weren't doing anything. Yeah, they not they just didn't, didn't assume you were at that level of yeah, intelligence it, or importance. Yes, like right? you were good enough to wash dishes. You were definitely good enough to mend wounds. Good enough to stitch clothes, and but you're not good enough to know anything about strategic maneuvers and what military tactics. Right. That's now, not now, now. There was one person. Yeah, <laughs> that suspect that suspected Rose Greenhow, and this name's actually pretty well known. Yeah. So what happens is, people are like, he knew. Beauregard knew. Yeah. And the Union realizes that he knew, 
And so it's actually Seward, Seward who first suspects because he sees so many people. Because again, he could probably see her porch from his porch. Sure. He's just looking across He's the way. He's probably looking across the way going, look at all the union it's guys. Like I just went in there. And she just loves Jefferson Davis. Yeah. He probably, and so he hires Pinkerton. Yeah. The, like the Alan Pinkerton. Uh, the, uh, the Alan Pinkerton of the Pinkerton Detective Agency because they're actually working at the time for President Lincoln. Yeah. And they're actually working intel for President Lincoln. So he hires him. He goes, why don't you watch her house so in august so first battle bull run happens in july in august pinkerton's hired to look at rose greenhouse house again four blocks from the white house and he's literally just like peeking in the window <laughs> he's peeking, like he's standing on someone's shoulders looking in the windows like really if you're walking by and you're like look at them that yeah. guy on his so like shoulders <laughs> looking and he sees her entertaining union soldiers he sees her pulling out maps with Union soldiers and they're pointing at things. And you see her again, she's very good at pretending like she doesn't care. Oh my gosh, I'm just entertaining you and listening to what you have to say. But really that's all she cares about because that's those are the things she will bring is ciphered maps and ciphered intelligence. But Pinkerton sees that and he knows. And I say that Pinkerton is really like the true feminist because he believes yeah. that Ro, Ro Green, Rose Greenhouse is capable of this. Right. Like he's giving her a lot of agency that that other men at the time probably would not or and are basically not. Basically nobody else yes. except Seward who had gotten into some arguments with her in the past and kind of <laughs> lived across the street from her essentially. Yeah. Um, and so Pinkerton is giving her a lot of credit, which is totally due because she did it. And so he tries to accost her on the street right after this happens. And again, you're having this scenario of a Southern elite woman being accosted on the street by a working class gentleman. So Pink Pinkerton gets arrested yeah. <laughs> because you, people are going like, why are you harassing this woman? Why are you looking in her window? Yeah. Why are you on the street? So he gets arrested, taken to prison. And when he's questioned, he says, I'm here for a bigger cause. I'm here for a bigger purpose. And so then he's allowed to go to Rose Greenhouse home and when he searches her home, he finds the ciphers right. and the maps. And she gets arrested. And she gets arrested. And she's put on house arrest at first in her home. But she doesn't stop spying. Yeah, she keeps getting information. <laughs> this is what I thought was so interesting for her is like she believes in her side of the cause so deeply that she continues to get information through her network. She had built up like a network of 40, 48 women, 40 to 50 women, and two men. Yeah. And she uses like colored curtains and she uses colored handkerchiefs, and candles in the windows, and candles in the windows. Yeah. And they can't stop her. So they're like, okay, we're going to put you in prison. And she's like, okay, do it. And so she's taken to the old Capitol prison in January of 1862. So things are moving relatively quickly when you think about it. The old Capitol prison is located directly behind the US Capitol. It's where the United States Supreme Court stands today. But this was a prison in DC that used to hold congr congressional hearings and meetings. And Rose Greenhow, when she went there, she writes this whole biography of herself after then I'll tell you when she writes this. So you get a lot of this first source account of what happened from her. She sits in the prison and all she can think about is Jefferson Davis giving a talk in one of the rooms. And she hopes to see that room again because that talk was so inspiring for her about him. And so she can't get even get Jefferson Davis off the mind in prison. Now this prison is going to hold uh, Confederate officers it's going to execute confederate conspirators this is where the lincoln conspirators will eventually be held before they are executed so this prison is a pretty renowned prison in washington dc and she's held there from january of 1862 to may of 1862 so about four months because she still doesn't stop. Yeah, she's still getting messages out. She's she still uses using... her daughter. Like she's put in prison with her eight-year-old daughter and she uses her daughter to get messages to out. messages, yeah. Her daughter's allowed to play in the middle of the grassy field to get some exercise. And her daughter will pass messages to people because sympathizers. And so eventually they're not going to execute her. They don't know what to do with her. This is the time why I say the federal government has not executed a woman in history, an American white woman in history yet. So they prison exchange her. So in May of 1862, she's exchanged for some Union prisoners. She's exchanged to the South. She's told, do not come back. Stay 
on the Confederate side. So she's exchanged down to Richmond, Virginia. And one of the first things she does <laughs> is meet with Jefferson Davis. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, you think about it like this, she was like at the point of brainwashed. Yeah. Like to, her loyalty was just so intense. And we've been to Davis's house, the Confederate White House yeah. in Richmond. She probably met him there. She probably. probably. And honestly, that's probably when she got most of her just like in-person recognition. Yes, yeah, she's she was right? very she, revered. She's a heroine, she's of, a heroine. Of, of the South. And then eventually she runs off to So eventually she overseas. goes to to Europe. Okay. And she goes to Europe to raise awareness for the Southern cause. And this is where she's going to write her autobiography. Okay. This is where she's going to write my first hand account of how terrible the North is and what they did to me. And but she's giving you basically how she spied and what she did. So it's very that's how we know the stuff she got across and how she did it. And she raises she brings her daughter over with her. She raises a lot of funds. She raises $2,000 in gold. And she comes back in August of 1864. She comes back. And she's on the HMS Condor, which is a, a British blockade runner. So a fast ship when you think about it. And she has $2,000 in gold sewn into her dress to hide the gold, get it back to the South. And the it's October 1st, the Condor is coming into Wilmington, North Carolina, and it gets grounded. It runs aground. The captain thinks he sees Union ships, so he tries to be covert, and he runs aground. And so Rose, is the, if they're coming, I, I want to get off the ship. Can I get a rowboat? And so she gets on a rowboat. And because she's carrying all this gold, and it makes it too heavy, too she heavy, and the ship sinks, and she is pulled down with it because of the gold, and she drowns. Her body is found four days later, and then she is given a full military decorated funeral That's wild. in Wilmington, North Carolina. They drape the Confederate flag across her coffin. It is full regala, and um, you can see her grave today. And it still has a plaque there and it's decorated. Her daughter will stay in France. She didn't bring her daughter with her. She didn't want to bring her daughter back in the middle of a war. But that is her legacy. She's lived on in the South as this m martyr, this heroine, this believer of a cause. Again, her big success was Bull Run. She never really gets any secrets. She really doesn't get the backing, the financial backing that she was hoping to get from the from England. But people remember her for bull run yeah another fun one for us to explore one because we just got to walk around washington mm -hmm. dc for the day because it's a huge walk it's from the capital yeah to the supreme court yeah, it was a hike and we got to hang out with lisa which yes, was really fun that was really so cool. if you guys are curious go check her channel out at historical usa but that was a blast <laughs> one of the things that i was thinking about was bravery it comes in all shapes and sizes and during the Civil War, many didn't think that bravery also came in all genders. Rose Greenhow may have been fighting for the wrong side of the Civil War, but no one will question that she had a direct impact on various aspects of the war. Just look at what happened at Manassas. Yes, it took Alan Pinkerton himself giving her credit to be suspicious enough to investigate this Civil War Confederate spy. Someone who is now viewed as a traitor to the North, but a heroine to the South. So thank you for listening to the Talk With History podcast. And please reach out to us at our website, talkwithhistory.com. But more importantly, if you know someone that might enjoy this podcast, please share it with them. Especially if you think today's topic would interest a friend. We rely on you, our community, to grow. And we appreciate you all every day. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you.